Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My name is Neha. I am a participant of the 43rd batch of the postgraduate diploma in management, rural management, of the Institute of Rural Management, Anand. And I shall be the master of ceremony for today's event. I request all of you to please put your phones on silent mode. Thank you. I now request our chairman, Dr. Manish Shah, and the director of IRMA to kindly escort the chief guest to this stage. We have gathered today for the 11th Dr. Vargas Kurian Memorial Lecture in memory of the founder chairman of IRMA, Dr. Vargas Kurian, and to celebrate his 102nd birth anniversary. We are honored to have our, as our chief guest, Dr. Shrikant Samrani, economist and writer, and first memory member secretary and director of IRMA, to deliver the 11th Dr. Vargas Kurian Memorial Lecture. Welcome, sir. We will begin with a floral tribute. We will begin with a floral tribute to our founder chairman, Dr. Vargas Kurian. I request our chief guest, Dr. Samrani, Dr. Manish Shah, Chairman Irma, and Dr. Uma Kandash, Director Irma, to kindly pay their tribute to Dr. Kurian. Thank you, sirs. I now request Dr. Minesh Shah and Dr. Uma Kandash to kindly felicitate the Honorable Chief Guest. I request Dr. Uma Kandash, Director, Irma, to give the welcome address. A very good morning, distinguished speaker, Dr. Srikant Samrani, chairman, members of the governing body, and society members of Irma faculty and staff, colleagues, participants of PGDRM, APM, and PGDRMX, friends and media, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to one and all. Irma welcomes you all to the 11th Dr. Varghese Kurian Memorial Lecture. We have gathered today to celebrate and remember the founder chairman of Irma, Dr. Varghese Kurian, his legacy, his character, his integrity, and his uh, enabling uh, fact factors, etc. I'm especially thankful to all of you who have joined us today virtually. Dr. Varghese Kurian passed away on September 9, 2012, but he will always be remembered for what he left behind. Institutions in the form of IRMA 
and the ones before it, people in the form of millions of farmers and his students, and most importantly, ideas that continue to inspire generations. He is the inspiration for millions of people around us who get up every morning with the thought of making a difference to the lives of the underserved, a thought instilled by Dr. Kurian's work and his life. Dr. Kurian envisaged Irma as a place of higher learning that would supplement the dedications to the cause of working for the underserved. This was also the philosophy behind the establishment of institutions like the Gujarat Cooperative Milk Marketing Federation, National Dairy Development Board, IDMC Limited, NCDFI, just to name a few. These institutions have served the country for more than half a century and will continue to do so because of the values that Dr. Kurian built them with. While some institutions were created to replicate Anand pattern of cooperatives, IRMA was created to prepare professional managers who would serve millions of farmers producers around the country. The real tribute to Dr. Kurian would be to remember the values he cherished the most, that of integrity, honesty, and dedication to a cause. Those are the values that should survive through generations and what I sincerely believe would be the true tribute to the great man that Dr. Varghese Kurian was. It's my pleasant duty to welcome Dr. Srikant Samrani, first member secretary and director of AIRMA for that 11th Dr. Varghese Kurian Memorial Lecture. A B.Tech in Chemical Engineering from IIT Bombay, he was awarded M.S. in Chemical Engineering by Northwestern University and Ph.D. in Economics by Cornell University. After brief teaching assignment in United States, he joined the faculty of the Center of Management in Agriculture at IIM Ahmedabad in 1971. Subsequently, he was the chief of the Research Bureau of Economic Times in 1979. He became the founder director of Irma, a one-of-the-kind institute then and now. Dr. Sabra Samrani is a part of the DNA of uh, Irma, and I'm sure that you are eagerly waiting to listen what he will surely be revisiting uh, lecture. Now I invite uh, the chairman, Dr. Minesha, to introduce our eminent guest speaker and invite him to deliver the 11th Dr. Varghese Kurian Memorial Lecture. Sir. Honorable Dr. Srikant Sabrani ji, members of the governing body of IRMA, especially uh, Mr. Toya Fukusan, uh, who is recently inducted all on the board of IRMA, Dr. Umakan Dash, Director IRMA, all invited guest friends, colleagues from NDDB, IRMA, and other institutes, participants of PGDM, FPM, PGDM, and uh, other programs. Good morning. I think we have uh, a very hectic day today from the morning. Uh, we, uh, we had the cycle rally, which started from Irma uh, at 7 o'clock. It visited all the institutes which have been uh, actually founded by Dr. Kurian, and there could not be a better homage or tribute to him than you know, going to all institutes, uh, getting all the memories uh, uh, again reestablished, and then uh, you know, committing ourselves to whatever he has done. Can we actually uh, contribute a part of it in taking forward the vision and uh, you know, the, uh, the efforts which he made for bringing the rural prosperity through uh, you know, daring as one of the instrument? I have had the privilege of working with him for many years, uh, and especially more closely uh, during uh, the, my first post, uh, you know, posting in overseas project of NDDB, uh, Kiriya Milk Industries in Sri Lanka. Uh, he was the chairman there, even after he uh, retired as chairman NDDB, and he became, you know, he continued as chairman IRMA. He continued to be the chairman of uh, the overseas joint venture in Sri Lanka. And some of the, I think, learnings which I had uh, in working with him, and uh, the way uh, you know he was guiding, uh, guiding professionals like us in, uh, you know, in contributing for the social and economic empowerment. I think uh, it's uh, it's unforgettable, and uh, we have seen. I was talking to Toya Fukusan while coming here. You know how in uh, one lifetime a person can 
found so many institutes which are catering to the different needs uh, for the social e and economic empowerment. The entire ecosystem, what you see in Anand, host of institutes, beginning from NDDB, Amul, uh, Irma, uh, Vidya Dairy, uh, you know, Foundation of Ecology Society and NCDFI. So you can name all of them and you can see that, you know, somewhere every organization is playing an important role uh, in, in, in taking forward some of the initiatives which he took uh, uh, for the social and economic empowerment. Uh, as I think we all know him and we all remember him as the man who put the uh, farmer in charge, uh, uh, you know, of his own cooperative. Uh, and uh, we have seen how a, a, you know, a structure developed very differently from the cooperatives what we see in other countries where the entire value chain being the procurement of raw material, processing of raw material, or even the marketing, uh, I think entire value chain is owned by the farmers. I have not seen such a uh, value chain which is managed entirely by the cooperatives, and perhaps that is the reason uh, the dairy sector or the dairy cooperatives are still valid today, still successful model uh, to replicate, uh, you know, maybe uh, on the other commodities as well. And uh, coming back to Irma, I think Dr. Kurian established Irma in 1979 uh, for nurturing and developing the rural management professionals because he realized that for uh, taking care of this vast number of institutes which were founded for furthering the objective of uh, National Dairy Development Board and uh, the related activities, it was necessary that we get such students who can uh, so our society at a large, uh, with their experience, with their uh, understanding of the rural realities. Otherwise, he would have just sent 10, 15 employees from each institute to IIMs. It, it was possible. But then he wanted that, uh, you know, that will not be actual purpose for which, uh, you know, the IRMA was set up. And uh, I'm thankful. Uh, I think uh, who better than Dr. Srikant Sambraniji can you know highlight and explain us the circumstances under which Irma was set up, under which uh, you know he also worked very closely with Dr. Kurian when Irma was being uh, set up. So, uh, uh, as we know, Dr. Vargis Kurian's memorial lectures over the years uh, have given us an opportunity to pay our uh, homage and tribute to Dr. Kurian. Uh, we have listened to various eminent personalities like. Uh, Professor M. S. Swaminathan, Professor Vyas, Professor Raghuram Rajan, Dr. Arvind Subramaniam, Sri Vikas Singh Mehta, uh, Professor Ramesh Chand, Sri Amitabh Kant, Dr. Prem Shankar Goel, Dr. Krishna Murthy Subramaniam, and Dr. Arun Mahira, uh, just did, uh, uh, before, I think, last year. So uh, I think uh, let us pay uh, homage again to the great men today. I am honored to invite uh, uh, our chief guest and speaker, Dr. Srikant Sabraniji, who was the first member secretary and also director of IRMA, and also a renowned economist and a writer. IRMA take, uh, actually took the shape uh, under his leadership, and which is now we know, all know it has emerged as a one of its kind institute. Uh, his contribution to the institute is inval invaluable, and it is our distinct pleasure to have him here as chief guest today. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation, and I will be grateful if you can share your views. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Thank you, Dr. Das, and all your friends here in the audience. Too many to name, so I will just say friends. Uh, we are gathered here today to uh, pay tribute to Dr. Kurian's memory. He must also own the blame of thrusting me on this unsuspecting audience. Uh, Dr. I.G. Patel 
left a, an indelible mark on a young boy about economics and the uh, profession of economic advisors. I had come to know this architect of early Indian economic policy as a schoolboy, and nearly two decades later, armed with degrees in engineering and economics from premier institutions in India and the United States, I firmly believed that economics could do to societies what engineering did to structures, set right the problems and get things going. How naive I was at that time, time alone will tell. So there I was as a young faculty member, first at the Institute, Indian Institute of Management, and then at the Economic Times, spreading my ignorance merrily about on unsuspecting people. But it was Dr. Kurian who put me, who thrust me into the real life of policies and executions. Uh, and he gave us the strength, and the Institute and its first head were always happy that somebody with great vision and abilities always had their back. And therefore, we could do whatever we wanted to without fearing very many bad effects. Uh, I have taken many decisions in my long life, and I am happy to say that coming to Irma was the second best decision of my life. Uh, I, I have narrated elsewhere the story of how Dr. Kurian Sweet talked me into coming here. So in that sense, I backed into that decision. But I must say today how very happy I was with that. Uh, we have gathered on this lovely campus, which at one time was just killing fields of tobacco when we took over the land. No tree, nothing, just flat lands, and so on. Now the trees have grown, as has the institution, all thanks to the vision of Dr. Kurian. Uh, the institute is grateful for the munificent support that NDDB has provided all along. And Dr. Kurian ensured that he created a corpus so that support would continue forever and so on. But Dr. Kurian's greatest contribution is an intangible one, which cannot be counted in money. During my first meeting with him after I came to Anand to join the institute, he told me that he had the absolute final say on three matters, external appearance of the buildings, finances of the institute, and interface with the external bodies, uh, especially funding bodies and the government and so on. I was very happy to say that, uh, to accept that. He said that I was free to do whatever else was required for the institution, and he would back me to the hilt. So he scrupulously adhered to this promise. Never once did he question me or anyone else about matters such as staff appointments, curriculum design, student admission, and what we actually taught and how we taught. The only faculty meeting he attended, although he was invited to all of them, the only faculty meeting he attended was the last one that I had held as, a, as the head of the institution. He was kind enough to say that the, he never bothered about it because he knew the institute was in good hands. So in today's terms, when state after state rushes into enacting legislations to control academic institutions, Kurian, Dr. Kurian early championed academic freedom, which is something that we must be most grateful for, for laying down that foundation. And I, that is why I called him a champion academic entrepreneur in my obituary to him. So I think we deserve to remember all that. I must also recall here my association with these lectures. The very first lecture was delivered by Dr. M.S. Swaminathan. 
and Dr. Jimo Luni, who was then the director of the institute, asked me to come and introduce the eminent speaker, which was an honor, I thought. I had known Dr. Swaminathan from 1976 onwards. He had come then to deliver the convocation address at IIMA. And the convocations are always held in the Louis Kahn Plaza. That magnificent structure inspires awe among all. And uh, invariably, people talk about how they admire the structure. But not Dr. Swaminathan. When he started his convocation address, he said, you must be used to getting compliments. But when I look at all these thousands of bricks here, I think of the topsoil that went into making them, and how many centuries nature had taken to create that topsoil, and how much food it could have helped produce. So there was stunned silence after that. But he had introduced his theme, which was priority, which was feeding the world. And I, I think he had done exactly the right thing. When I introduced him in the first memorial lecture in 2013, I mentioned this to him, and I said, you have probably forgotten this, sir. He admitted that he had forgotten, but he stood committed to what he had said then because the problem hadn't disappeared. I have often wondered why these two gentlemen, Dr. Kurian and Dr. Swaminathan, along with Dr. I.G. Patel, have not received the nation's highest honor, Bharat Ratna. Now that we, offer, we, we give it posthumously, it is my fervent hope that before long, all of them will be honored with this. When I was invited to deliver this lecture, immediately my thought was on transformative potential of rural management. Uh, I might, I, I have to go back again to autobiographical mode. When I was offered a job at IIMA, I was also offered the choice of subjects. I chose instinctively agriculture, Center for Management in Agriculture, because I knew nothing about it. And I wanted to know more about it. So my first boss, the tough taskmaster, Dr. D.K. Desai, um, assigned me a project which nobody wanted. That was on rural unemployment and poverty. So there I was trotting off to the badlands of Panchmahals, tribal Panchmahals, when my colleagues jetted around the country talking to business uh, tycoons and so on. But all of that proved worthwhile when an elderly gentleman, after I had talk, walked for about two hours, told me that I was the first person wearing trousers that he had seen after Mr. Morarji Desai, who was in the 19 early 1930s, the deputy collector of Panchmahals. So that's how backward this, this whole area was. And so I continued with that. And I continued doing various other things, which my wife once described as counting rice grain in Bhattapara in Chhattisgarh. So all this time, I counted not only rice grains, but I also counted poplar trees, I counted cows, I counted coffee beans, and very many other things. So this is a, this is a theme, this is a song that I can sing with some feeling. This is a relatively sad song, but not entirely. Percy Bysshe Shelley, the poet, said that our sweetest songs are those that tell of saddest thoughts. And our own Shailendra, the film lyricist, said, hai sabse madhura geet wo geet jinne hum dard ke sur mein gaate hain. But these are sweet songs, because there is an aura of positivity as I will come to it. So I have been saying what I have to say today is something that I have been saying and writing for a very long time. Some of you may know some of it already, but this lecture gives me an opportunity 
to put all of that together in one comprehensive analytical framework, which is something that has given me a great deal of pleasure. India was leading a ship-to-mouth existence in the early 1970s, following the great drought of the previous decade. The Green Revolution was just unfolding. Details of monsoons, crops, etc., were available, but they were always consigned to an inside page of the newspaper, which nobody bothered to read. Uh, Dandekar, V. M. Dandekar, and Neil Kantrath had published a study called "Poverty in India," but that was published in the Economic and Political Weekly which only the cognoscenti, the knowledgeable people, read. So poverty was endemic, was widespread, but invisible at that time, basically. It was not on anybody's agenda. That was then. The harsh reality of village India in the third decade of the 21st century is that it lags far behind the rest of the country. I will use from now on the term Bharat to designate village India, although now the government wants us to use Bharat for the entire country and India for the rest of it. Uh, it, it lagged behind in income, in infrastructure, in uh, governance and facilities that improve the quality of life. Unfortunately, this difference has been growing all through the seven and a half, eight decades of independence. Numerous initiatives have been undertaken during all this time to help improve the quality and the conditions of rural life. These efforts are all covered under the umbrella title of rural development. We have made great strides in some areas, but on the whole, the, what we see are some islands of prosperity amidst a vast sea of poverty. The challenge now is to make sure that these islands get connected to a more prosperous uh, India. Indian peasantry's misery has continued since medieval times. In, it was in the rural population was in thrall to local lords, warlords, and zamindars, and so on and served as conscripted soldiers when they needed them. Raja Todarmal attempted modest reforms during the reign of Akbar, but even that lapsed into uh, some kind of zamindari after the tax system was uh, incorporated. Farmers remained tied to their land, partly because of custom, partly because of the caste structure, partly because of kinship, but mostly because there was nothing else that they could do. So in David Ricardo's turn of 18th century England, farmers were rentiers, but they could leave their land when the conditions were adverse to them. And they did in vast numbers. So they became the army for the Industrial Revolution. Similar patterns happened elsewhere in Europe, and so, yeoman peasantry became the, uh, the, the uh, feedstock of industrial revolution. Unfortunately, such a thing never happened in India. And the numbers of farmers continued to grow because as diseases and wars diminished, population increased, and the same amount of land was supporting more and more uh, uh, people. Let me give you just a few numbers. India had a GDP of about $20 billion at the time of independence. I'm talking of the then numbers in then current prices. And a population of 360 million. 70% of that pop population, uh, two-thirds of that population depended on agriculture. And 70% of the GDP came from agriculture. So roughly, the per capita income in agriculture and non-agriculture income was about the same. In 2022, India has a GDP of about $3 trillion. 
the population is 1.4 billion. Nearly half of it, 46 to 48 percent, depends on agriculture for its survival. But agriculture contributes only 14 percent of the GDP. So while one half of the population depends on agriculture, it derives only one seventh of the total income. The uh, per capita income in non-agricultural sector is about $3,500, whereas in agriculture it is only about $600. So the difference is close to one is to six, and that has been widening ever since. That is today's story. Agriculture growth kept pace with uh, overall economy until about the 1980s at what uh, Raj Krishna called Hindu rate of growth of 3.5% per annum. But thereafter, the economy spurted, agriculture remained static. The, in, for example, in the decade of 2003 to 2012, Economy, the economy grew at about 9%, the highest it has ever grown. But agriculture declined by that time to a growth rate of about 1%. Since then, it has climbed back to about 3%. But the investment in agriculture still remains at only 1%. So further growth in agriculture is, uh, is very difficult. This occurs because land has remained constant. It has not grown, while the population has increased. Uh, now, today, for example, the same land supports three times as many people. So what, was, what used to be a three hectare per family household holding is now down to about one to one and a half hectares, and so on, and that supports the same size of the family. So the, 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 the economic lot of the rural peasantry has substantially worsened. This results in a vicious cycle. The um, income from farming keeps stagnating, if not decline. Life is squalid. And alternative means of livelihood are not available. At any rate, if they are available, people concerned do not have skills to qualify for them. The vicious circle can be summed up as saying, I am poor because I was born to poor uh, parents and my children will be poorer. That is the vicious circle. Resignation sets in, despair comes in, aspiration rules India, but despair is the prevailing mood in Bharat. Periodic calamities, floods, droughts, epidemics, makes matter worse for rural India. The commonly accepted wisdom is that our agriculture is remarkably inefficient, causes enormous losses, leads to huge exploitation, and favors the middleman, who doubles up as the local money lender. There is a kernel of truth in all of these, but not entirely. Some of it is made up, some of it is exaggerated, and because it is repeated often enough, it is accepted as God's own truth. <coughs> the biggest fallacy that we have is that we equate rural life with agriculture, agriculture with crop cultivation, crop cultivation with cereals, and cereals with rice and wheat. That is not true at all. Today, for example, crop cultivation accounts for a little over 60% of the value added in the agriculture sector. The remainder is made of livestock, fisheries, and forestry. In fact, cereals provide <coughs> only about 17% of the agriculture output, value of agriculture output. Horticulture provides about 17%, and dairy and animal husbandry provides 19%. So you can see that our mistake of equating everything to crop cultivation, 
continues to misguide us. The Indian productivity of most crops is low, abysmally low, and low compared to international averages, low compared to even other countries. China, which began at about the same time in under, under the same conditions, today produces nearly twice as much food grain, food, as we do on 60% of the land that we use it. So that is how uh, we have lagged behind. The Green Revolution took us away in the mid from, in, from the mid-1960s onwards from the ship to mouth syndrome. We became self-sufficient in food and since then have remained there with occasionally some small surpluses. But the per capita availability of food grain has not increased. In fact, it has declined slightly. So while we, grain production has kept pace with population, just about barely so. The situation would, should have normally led to dramatic price increases because of shortages and so on. That has not happened most of the time because governments of the day have been acutely aware that onions bring tears not only to the people who chop them, but also to the governments. Sushma Swaraj lost her government because of rising onion prices at the start of the 1990s. And that situation continues all the way through. Governments are extremely sensitive, and so they control the prices through the mechanism of uh, minimum support price and so on and so forth. That keeps the consumer happy, but that also reduces the cash income of the farmer and the incentive for the farmers. Farmers have no incentive to invest. Consider this. You have inherited a decrepit property whose tenants do not move. The rental does not even pay for the upkeep. The building is about to fall. But you have no incentive nor any resources to upgrade it. So why would you care for that property? And the farmer is no fool. That is how he looks at his present livelihood. He does it because there is nothing else that he can do. So you find that subsidies and other incentives keep him going, but just barely so. The, we understand that farmers would suffer in the event of a poor crop because they don't have enough to sell. But they also suffer at the time of a good crop because there is a surplus. That might sound paradoxical to you, but the farmer has no ability to withhold his crop from selling at the time of harvest because of his need to pay back the cost of cultivation. And therefore, we have uh, this situation where the farmer suffers either because of the plenty or because of the famine. And it also brings to the fore the uh, existence of what is called the cobweb phenomenon. The good price in one year leads to an increase in the land cultivated that acts as an incentive. Next year, the crop is large, so the price falls, and the acreage falls, and the cycle goes on. And the best example of this I can give you through a personal interaction. In 1979, you, you won't remember, most of you were not even born at that time, Charan Singh presented the first agriculture-oriented budget. He was the deputy prime minister at that time. I was at the Economic Times, and I wrote, the, I got the paper to write an editorial, the only paper to support the budget. So I was immediately favored with an interview, I received a summons that the minister would like me to interview him. So I went, and I went into his very large North Block office in Delhi, which was set up practically as a hospital room because he had earlier suffered a heart attack. He was sitting at his desk with, he had a remarkably firm voice though, with a delegation from his home constituency who were all demanding greater sugarcane price. So he took off his cap, and there was a stubble on his head. 
So he pointed to it and he said, Gani Mathai, aapne yaha ne ganna boya. He, was, he had the standing to advise his farmers that they have to be more careful. But cobweb exists even today. And we see this immediately in the case of vegetables. Ups and downs that we see every year, within the year, apart from natural factors, but also because of the, uh, the, the uh, existence of this economic phenomenon. MSPs are supposed to overcome some of this, and therefore there is some merit in considering that. The Agriculture Costs and Prices Commission decides support prices after taking into account all the various costs. That has been criticized. The Dr. Swaminathan Commission on Farmers had recommended that the price should be 50% above the cost of cultivation after taking into account even the implicit costs of production, such as family labor and family capital used. That has never been implemented. And despite all the talk of doubling farm incomes, we have not achieved that. There's another problem that, for the most part, <coughs> MSP works for only selected crops. The rest of the crops, despite the availability of MSP, have no buyers. The most dramatic example was about three years ago when pulses prices in the pulse growing areas fell to about 70% of the MSP because there were no buyers. So MSPs are only a limited answer. We also talk about losses in the supply chain. Largely we believe that these losses amount to 30 or 40%. As, large, as much as that. Now, in field, but that is not a correct estimate. Part of it is folklore. Part of it is just extrapolation. Field crops, such as grains and even cotton, etc., have to be bulked and debulked at various stages because of buyer's examination and so on. And they suffer a loss in that process. But that is single digit. Horticulture crops, vegetables, etc., suffer greater losses because of their perishability and the long chain to the market. And that is also a different thing. In 1989, I was talking to the Prime Minister's secretary on various other things, and he asked me to estimate the loss. I said, I can't. He said, I have power in this building. I will not let you out until you give me a figure. So on that compulsion point, I told him that my guess, and I had very clearly said guess, is that about a third is value destruction. Not physical loss, but value destruction. I will explain the difference in a minute. And he accepted that. That was mentioned in the budget that year. And since then, it has become a line etched in stone. Everybody talks about 30%, 33% of the loss without all the qualifiers that I had attached to it. The value destruction means that what is the correct value and what is the realized value. For example, the tomatoes which sell in the morning in the retail market at 10 rupees a kilo, whatever is left over is sort of overripe and so on. But at the end of the day, it is probably sold at one or two rupees to whoever buys it. Now, that is value destruction. That is not physical destruction. The physical loss could be well under 10%. But value destruction is much greater. But that is a reality of rural life. And you have to make sure. And various, the, uh, so various remedies have been proposed, such as, for example, processing. There is a problem, though, that there is a f what, what is described as a feast or famine syndrome. At the start of the season, there is a surplus, that is the feast. And within a short time, there is a shortage, that is famine. So the buyer for processing never has an assured stock, assured supply of his uh, requirements. That is why Pepsi gave up tomato processing in Punjab, which it, which it had taken up 
with a great deal of enthusiasm. And these kind of things have been happening all over the country at all times. Uh, then we have marketing committees which talk about uh, marketing uh, APMCs, Agriculture Produce Marketing Committees, which are popularly uh, considered villains. They are inefficient, they are politically manipulated. <coughs> but Gujarat APMCs have been functioning extremely well. In Maharashtra, they don't function for some crops. But for vegetables, the new Navi Mumbai APMC works wonderfully. So APMCs, like the, uh, the middlemen, have many valid functions. When we say that they are the villains, we, should, we have selective references, and we should refrain from talking about it. Uh, there is also a problem of uh, <coughs> agricultural loans. I will come to it in a minute. But if you ask today the farmer about his lot, what he will overwhelmingly tell you, whether he's a surplus producing farmer or a subsistence peasant, that his consumption standards are poor. And he defines these consumption standards not in absolute terms, but in comparative terms. He looks at other people around him and decides what his consumption standard ought to be. And he rightly sees that his urban counterparts have better consumption standards. And if you ask him, would he want to continue in agriculture, the thundering answer would be no. Would you all like your son to be in agriculture? Again, the thundering answer would be no. Ravi Mathai started a project in Jawaja in Rajasthan, the most backward block at that time. And he was talking about rural development. He visited there, and he asked uh, in his first meeting the farmers, what would you like your son to be? He thought that they would say a good farmer, a good uh, village level worker or whatever. They all said they would like their sons to be like him, wearing trousers and having an urban job. And Ravi was surprised. When he narrated this story to me, I said, Ravi, you are being naive because he sees that you enjoy the good life which he or his sons don't. And that is what he wants to, to happen. That deprivation, income deprivation, is what motivates the farmer. It results in his often taking recourse to disposing of his capital assets. This has happened again and again. When we see the Punjab farmers living in luxurious houses or driving uh, latest SUVs and so on, we don't realize that they have got that through the sale of their land. They have liquidated their capital assets for the sake of their consumption requirements. Now, economics would tell us that that is a sure way of further economic misery. But we don't remember that. And in this connection, we have to think of the loans. No institutional loans provide for personal consumption requirements, which could be overwhelming. The farmer borrows money from various sources. He can use money from whichever source for whatever purpose, because money in the economic terms is a fungible. And therefore, he, he uses up. It is natural that in a bad year, he would not have enough to repay the amount. But one could argue that in a good year, he has surplus, so he can make up that uh, deficit from the previous year. But the fact of life, rural life, is that deficits are cumulative, surpluses are not. When the surplus materializes, there are always urgent needs. A family wedding, repairs, treatment of a sick person in the family, and that uses up the surplus. The deficit continues to mount, the loan burden continues to mount. Under pressure, the government from time to time resorts to to loan waivers. The first such came about in 1990 under Madhu Dandavate. The next one was in 2008 under the UPA government. 
writing at that time, I had said that this is no answer and that this will recur. Now that prophecy, that had an ominous ring of prophecy. And it has, I am sorry to say that it has happened again and again. Loan waivers are even now in 2023 a matter of election promises. And they will continue. That is because we see loans as a, as, as a symptom, but we don't see the structural problem. And we try to give the palliative of loan waivers. That is like giving paracetamol to a patient. Paracetamol breaks your fever, but it does not cure the disease. Similarly, loan waivers do not cure the disease of rural poverty. Uh, but again and again, we find that agriculture marketing keeps coming up. We say it is least reformed and we must reform. But whenever reform comes up, whenever any tragedy happens, like floods or droughts or unexpected uh, unseasonal rain and so on, the immediate, immediate recourse is to appeal to the government for help. So my Bap Sarkar is always there. There is a song from a 1970s movie, uh, 1960s movie, Dilek Mandir, and the heroine sings that Panchi ko chudakar uska ghar tum apne ghar le aaye. Jab ye pinjara man bhaya hum ji bhar ke muskaaye. Jab pyar hua is pinjare se tum kehte ho ud jao. So the, the farmer has got used to this support. And therefore, when offered reform, he doesn't know what to do. And it is not my case to say that agriculture or markets should be completely free or market determined. Even in China, that thing has not happened. But certainly, we could do with more freedom and more independence, that, because that is how the rest of the economy has made its progress over the period. In all this period, as I said, Maibab Sarkar is the first and last uh, resort of assistance. What has happened is that government has been, all governments have been acutely aware of rural distress, and they have done whatever they could in order to reduce the dis uncertainties and so on. The first priority was, of course, irrigation, and a large number of dams were constructed in the first 30, 40 years of independence. Today, the situation is that irrigation uh, potential, surface irrigation potential of most large river basins has been exhausted, except the ecologically sensitive sub-Himalayan and northeastern region. What we have not done, though, is local initiatives, check dams and farm pond reservoirs. In Gujarat, in Saurashtra alone, over the decade of 2001 to 2011, some 100,000 local ponds were created, check dams were created. And that changed the face of Saurashtra agriculture. This is something that can be done with local participation, much less resource requirement, and with great deal of flexibility, plus also the farm ponds and so on, which we have not as yet attempted. Governments provide, as I said, MSP. Governments provided the package program, which emphasized the use of integrated use of inputs and loans and credit, as well as provided extension agency. But all of these ended up peaking at one time and remained frozen at that time. The government also distributed dole disguised as relief programs. The greatest example being the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Scheme. And that it in design was different, but in practice it ended up being a dole. So now we have, for example, the permanent uh, employment syndrome that, you know, as Keynes had explained, digging ditches and filling them. 
we have our own equivalent that kacha roads get built as part of employment generation and they get washed away during the monsoon so they can be built all over again. So this can go on ad infinitum. But that again does not solve the problem either of rural poverty or rural infrastructure development. Uh, so what happens is that these are all sporadically effective. Now, what we need to do is move away from simply relief to a longer term vision of livelihood restructuring. The great Chinese sage Confucius had said that if he gave a fish to a hungry man, he would satisfy his day's need. He would be hungry again tomorrow. But if he taught him how to fish, he would take care of his hunger for the rest of his life. We have been doing just the giving fish to the hungry man. We have not taught them how to fish. Results we always see in terms of money spent, in terms of roads built, in terms of employment days created. But we don't bother to get into the details of how, whether they have made any dent on poverty, whether they have reduced the inc incidence of poverty. Ideally, a scheme like Manarega should be self-liquidating. That with advancement, there should be less and less need for it. On the contrary, we find more and more demand for Manarega. That means the problem has not even touched upon. So, except for the early years of Green Revolution, we have not seen much dynamics, much uh, vigor, and so on. What misses out is the last mile hand-holding support. Let me give you an example. If you find that the rural households have a problem of mobility, the government decides to give them a bicycle. But the farmer doesn't know how to ride the bicycle, and nobody teaches him. So either the bicycle sits there, rusting away, or he sells it for whatever little money he can get. The problem of limited mobility remains, and the cycle hasn't done anything. So what I, what I meant to say is that the government approach amounts to throwing money at the problem, hoping that it would go away. Life is not that simple. I would now, having painted this relatively gloomy picture, the sad part of it, I would like to bring some sweet music to it by telling you of some success stories, whatever there are. The first and foremost I can think of is sugar cooperatives in Maharashtra. They have transformed Western Maharashtra. They used up in the process an invaluable resource, that of ANSYS, the, the uh, trapped water under Deccan uh, trap. And that was geologically trapped, never can be replaced, but they have used it and that has brought prosperity. But it has also made the sugarcane farmers into uh, uh, into rentiers. They are absentee landlords on their own land because the sugar factory does everything. The second is this very place, milk cooperatives. And I will come to that in a minute. But before that, I would like to tell you of some other stories. The main limitation of this is that they are, as I said before, they are islands. And they are in constant danger of being swamped by the sea of poverty surrounding them. Let me go back to the 1980s. At that time, the Swedish match company subsidiary in India, Wimco, the world's largest mechanized match manufacturer, had faced a shortage of uh, match wood. They could not exploit the Andaman Nicobar uh, forestry because ecological considerations forbid that. So a visionary management decided that they would encourage the growth of poplars, which were not common in India. Poplars are trees that grow straight. And if you see Hindi movies, in scenes of 
hero and heroine riding in Kashmir, they are always flanked by these natural poplar trees. So Vimco management decided that it would like to encourage poplar cultivation in North India. Of course, the Food and Agriculture Organization immediately put its foot down, said that was not possible. Poplars would not grow in India. But Wimco management took the decision anyway. They worked out a novel scheme whereby they encouraged the concept of three-dimensional farming. They would like, they wanted ordinary farmers, regular farmers, to grow poplar trees on their farms. So the first five years, the poplar trees have negligible sh shade and regular field crops could be taken. So we went, I was part of the consulting team, we went to Nabad, persuaded them to approve that scheme and uh, thankfully we didn't encounter Mohan at that time, he would have voted it down. But we persuaded and the commercial banks were encouraged to make term lending for agriculture the very first time. All the needed documentation, then Wimco hired a team of young professionals who collected the documentation, handed it over to the banks. And they also, Wimco also started a sapling program, nurseries, and this young team would also provide extension assistance. This was not free, for which they charged. In return, they said, that any mortality in trees for the first two years would be replaced free. So the uh, banks loaned 300 rupees per tree, which would get on maturity 800 rupees. So all the costs were covered, and this was a win-win situation for all concerned. The banks fulfilled their lending target, farmers earned good income, and Wimco got its match supplies. The program was successful beyond imagination. During the second year, the target had to be doubled twice because there was such a great demand for it. But the more interesting story is that by the year 2000, Wimco no longer existed because it had fallen afoul of the government regulations which encouraged cottage scale match production. So while the parent company wound up, eventually, the subsidiary, Wimco Seedlings, which was dealing in poplars, it thrived. It was a profit-making company. And poplars were popular, they still are, and they became raw material for the plywood industry. Yamuna Nagar, which was a sleepy town in Haryana, has become a thriving, bustling market for this. The interesting thing was that when a farmer was interviewed about his young saplings, and he was asked various searching questions as to why he, uh, why he planted them. I was playing the devil's advocate. He said at the end, such cows up, poplar ki khete mein bada sakoon milta hai. Now, sakoon is a concept which is difficult to translate. It is a feeling of innate wellness, happiness, welfare. And that sakoon came not from the non-existent shade or breeze, but from his inner feeling. And that summarizes what the response, true response was. Then there's another instance that I would like to narrate. Araku Valley in Vishakhapatnam district in uh, Andhra Pradesh is at the tri-junction of Chhattisgarh, uh, Odisha, and Andhra Pradesh. Which is, uh, a, for, which is at the height of about 1,200 meters in the Eastern Ghats, forested and uh, Maoist in, uh, infested. So it is largely tribal area. Uh, the tribals are called Khond. They speak a language that is a mixture of Odia and Telugu. They have been there for time immemorial. They practiced uh, shifting cultivation, slash and burn cultivation, but as the land became less and their numbers rose, they became, uh, they became fixed residents and their villages did not move. By the way, their villages have always been scrupulously clean, long before Swachh Bharat Abhiyan came up, unlike plains people. 
So we have much to learn from them. And the, uh, in the late 80s, the Andhra Pradesh Tribal Development Corporation decided to introduce coffee cultivation. So they provided saplings, coffee saplings, and they set up a processing facility. But they forgot to take care of the marketing. So coffee beans were sold in the local market, fetching very limited price, and the farmers quickly lost interest in this. The whole thing fell into disrepair. In the late 80s, early 1990s, a voluntary agency, a large voluntary agency called Nandi came into this area. Nandi was uh, started by Anji Reddy of Dr. Reddy Pharmaceuticals, but it also had participation from various Andhra uh, industrialists. They were there initially for portable water supply and hygiene issues, but they saw in coffee a potential. So they recruited staff, they set up field office, the staff provided more coffee plantations and uh, coffee saplings and a, a processing facility, and they started marketing. They assured the farmers the equivalent of 90 rupees a kilo of processed beans, which was remunerative. The farmers responded. In the meanwhile, the Nandi people contacted uh, European manufacturers, uh, which European uh, programs, which offered uh, organic products, and they managed to persuade them to accept the Araku Valley coffee. Araku Valley coffee was called Araku Premium Gold. And they, they even managed to get some uh, premium for that. So in the very second year, they grew 300 plus tons of coffee, got money enough to pay a premium to the growers, build their own facility, and they decided to hold the first annual general meeting in Araku Valley Station itself. Araku Valley is a railway station. It also has a, is a truck stop on the Vizag Calcutta Highway. Normally a sleepy place where people just stop for refueling and some food. But on the day of the first annual meeting, it saw its first traffic jam. They had invited, the, the committee had invited all the members of the cooperative to come for the meeting. They expected some 500 or 600, and they thought that was an exaggeration. Actually, 3,000 people showed up, and they cl clogged up the road. They were going to provide food, so the, the committee had to request the local restaurants to down their shutters and cook extra food. They provided a T-shirt, which people wore over there, right then and there, over their clothes, including the ladies. So that goes to show the identification of this. And now Araku co Coffee has become established in the uh, safe food uh, worldwide and so on. And the farmers have become more prosperous. There are junior colleges when even primary college schools did not exist. Some health facilities provide, are provided. So that is another success story. And I come back to Anand, not because it is the last on my agenda, but because you know about it. And I don't really have to go into great deal of details. And all that I want to say is a few salient details, and the rest of it is partly in my lecture script, partly you can, you know it yourself. Uh, started in 1946 to get farmers' remunerative prices from the Bombay Milk Scheme. Uh, it has now grown to a movement which has over a million members, household members, in the state of Gujarat. From early uh, turnover, it has now crossed, the, their, the cooperative organization, GCMMF, has crossed an annual turnover of more than 9 billion US dollars. From just milk, it has widened the whole product range. But the Im most important part is that the lion's share of that $9 billion, it goes back to farmers as the price. 
more than 85% of the revenue goes back to farmers. So, and now the Amul brand is so ubiquitous that it, it is in all kinds of things where it did not exist before. It even sells atta and bread and so on and so forth. And every day there are new products that come up that we read about it. Now they are going to sell, uh, just yesterday I heard about they are selling extra protein milk apart from a. There is a great deal of product innovation and in the last 10 years they must have added I don't know how many products. But now Amul is considered a giant, not just in, it is the largest food brand, all right, but it is among the largest FMCGs in the country. At one time, Rupinder Sodhi had to write to newspapers saying, when they said so-and-so was the largest food processing company, he had to always take issues with them and say, no, that is not true, Amul is the one. Now, nobody questions that. So you see how that has transformed. Amul is now active all over the country and even outside. So you can see, for example, our chairman and uh, the GCMMF MD recently visited Sri Lanka to help revive their own dairy, which had been started in Dr. Kurian's time, but had fallen into disrepair. So you can see that the concept is solid, its execution lacked uh, support, and now it is coming back. So it is valid not just in India, but also for various other countries. So that is the strength of it. Uh, now, you see how this has changed is that in 1965, there was a butter and uh, milk protein uh, mountain being built up in the US, in, in the EU. And there was talk of giving it to India, free, as a gift. Dr. Kurian clearly saw this would threaten the slowly, the nascent milk economy of India. And he fought tooth and nail to ensure that this was not given free. NDDB received this gift on, part of, on behalf of government of India, sold the product in the market, raised money to finance further dairy development. That became known as Operation Flood. And it went through two or three cycles, spending more than 600 crore rupees, spreading the dairy movement to all corners of the country so that uh, dairying became a major occupation. How effective this Operation Flood or the White Revolution is something that we can understand by comparison. The Green Revolution trebled the cereal production between 1970 and 2020. But the White Revolution multiplied milk production by nine times in the same period. So today India is the largest milk producer in the world. And at 136 kilograms per person, per capita availability, is also the largest. People wonder where that goes, and I have a simple answer. We all have an incredible sweet tooth. We don't drink milk, but we consume milk sweets, like our life depended on it. So bulk of the milk goes into sweet making, which doesn't get accounted for. And therefore, when people say this is a misleading statistic, I say, look into what you eat after dinner, and then you will realize where the milk goes, and so on. So this is, this is how it has changed. And all of this is with minimum government support. Certainly no subsidies. Certainly no MSPs. The farmers have enough lobbying power. They, you know, there is an asymmetry between their production base. They are, these are all small individual one or two animal, maybe three or four based, but the market is very large, which that asymmetry is countered by the organization. The organization has the clout, and it can, it can demand its price in the market, and it has succeeded. 
How well it has succeeded can be gauged by the fact that some years ago, two or three years, three or four years ago, there was talk of India joining a common market with Asia, with Pacific and uh, Indian Ocean common market. It got shelved at the last minute because of one single organization's opposition, and that was GCMMF. GCMMF did not want it because it feared, rightly so, that uh, New Zealand would come in and New Zealand dairy surplus was facing a problem. We always compare ourselves to China and we find in so many areas we are lagging. But milk production is one area where we are miles ahead of China. So that is something that we need to be proud of. <laughs> Having said this, I must enter a small note of personal disappointment. For close to a decade, I have been wanting to do an analytical study of Amul and what all it did, and the history of the dairy cooperative. I wanted an oral history as part of the project. I requested first permission and then support. The permission never came, leave alone the support. Now all the participants from the early days are gone, so oral history part is also not possible. And I have to say reluctantly at the end of my productive life that this is one bucket wish, bucket desire of mine that will go unfulfilled. I'm sorry to say this, but I thought I would share this with you. Uh, now, this brings us to what works, why this works. Because there is a serendipity of technology and management. And that is what works in this case. Uh, now, for example, what we need to see here is that No, no, I'm not done. Please. <laughs> if you're tired, let me know. But I have, I have saved the best for the last. So if only I can find my papers here, I will quickly go back and collect. No, it's okay. It's not trivial to note that all these success stories that I talked of started from a very small base. So they were crying for some intervention, some potential that could be grown. And whether it is milk in Gujarat or coffee in Araku or grains in the rest of the country. Intervening intervention became gainful because there was a market. And that market had a positive price elasticity, which could benefit the farmers. Most important of all, most of the benefits went back to the farmers, which acted as an incentive. And there is a synergy here between public resources and private enterprise, which has worked. Also, most importantly, there is a people's participation. So when we talk about PPP initiative, we forget the last part, people's participation. What is important in all of this is people participated, and people participated wholeheartedly. So now, if ever a system that begged for reform, it is agriculture. That has not happened yet. Reform is not doing more of the same. Reform is doing things differently. If you give, if you have more land, more fertilizers, more seeds, obviously you will have greater crop. But if you do that under constrained condition, that is reform. Your desi buffalo gives you one or two liters of milk every day. But by taking good care of it, giving it proper feed, 
and proper hygiene, if you increase the productivity to five or six liters a day, that is the result of reform. That is what we forget in all our talk of reform. All right? Now, all activities are not possible in all regions. And therefore, we have to forget about one solution affecting everybody. One size does not fit all. And that is something that our government has never learned. In all designs of tried, tested, and failed schemes, we always prescribe a single format, and that is a surefire guarantee of it's not working. So we have to provide flexibility. And uh, again, we have to remember that income is what motivates people. If you say health, he may not be interested. But if you say income and health, that would be immediately interesting. So you have to make a binary of income and some other desired effect. That, is, that has not happened at all times in various activities. So it's, is this just a productivity related thing? No, it is much more. And we have to think outside of the silos, that we have to go away from agriculture alone. We have to promote rural craftsmanship, rural technology. That is how China grew. China diverted its people from agriculture into rural workshops. And then it became the workshop to the country. We have failed to do that. But we can do so. For example, if you think in terms of uh, bulk movement, instead of gunny bags and so on, if you talk about bulk storage in silos, that would promote much rural employment, and it would, in the process, add income as well as uh, surpluses in the rural areas. Now, we have two extreme views. Government knows best and leave it to the government. Or we say the government is useless, nothing happens. The fact is somewhere in between. We cannot do without government. The trick is how to get the government to do the right thing, not saying the government can be avoided altogether. Private initiatives by nature are limited. But as Nandi has shown, that resources of various private enterprises can be pooled and they would end up doing the right kind of thing. So the government realizes this and it is talking of clusters. When I joined IRMA, I had no idea what this beast rural management was. And we were constantly asked that question. There was much talk because of the umbilical cord that I and many of my colleagues shared with IIMA that this was a poor man's IIMA, a cut rate IIMA. That really made us very angry. We were not cut rate anything. We were the first institute of rural management anywhere in the world, and we were proud of it. But we. But we still debated what rural management was. And uh, I don't know whether Tushar is here, but Tushar Shah and I continued that debate until about seven, eight years ago, even though I had long gone away from Irma. And then suddenly thinking about it and thinking all of these examples, a uh, penny dropped. And now I can say with considerable certitude that the essence of rural management is the transformation of commodity production to enterprise. It is not subsistence, but it is enterprise. Farmers are practitioners of, in, farmers as practitioners of enterprise can use market actions and mechanisms to secure their legitimate ends and benefit without seeking external in, intervention. Since practice of rural management leads to enhanced income streams and change in risk perception, it would also end up in some resource constraints being loosened. 
In that sense, it is not a static concept, but it is a dynamic concept. So we have seen much advice on how to deal with rural distress, which is, means further tying down the producers to government apron string, rather than freeing them from it. Rural management interpreted in this fashion has the potential of truly being a liberal, liberating influence. And the one unreformed sector of the economy could be transformed. The vicious circle breeds despondency and resignation. The desired and feasible path out of the circle is gradual and not a mercurial uh, leap with a big bang. The decision horizon needs to move from next month, which is survival, to next year, which is guarded optimism, to next generation, which is aspiration. In the process, the dependency on outside change agents is replaced by self-assurance based on the newly acquired skills and knowledge. This is the true sakun that India has been craving for. And that is what a successful application of rural management achieves by unleashing the animal spirits of the humblest of peasantry. John Maynard Keynes said at, in his general theory that even apart from the instability due to speculation, there is instability due to the characteristic human nature that a large proportion of our positive activities depend on spontaneous optimism rather than on a mathematical expectation. Most probably, of our, our decisions to do something positive, the full consequences which will be drawn out over many days or years to come can only be taken as a result of animal spirits, of a spontaneous urge to action rather than inaction, and not as the outcome of the weighted average of quantitative benefits multiplied by quantitative probabilities. That is the animal spirits. Mains, Keynes would be pleasantly surprised that a century later and a continent away, that is what rural management plans to do. And there was never a more visionary champion of this than Dr. Varghese Kurian. Thank you. Yes, surely. I will be happy to answer whatever questions you have to the best of my ability. No, that's okay. I'm fine. Thank you so much. Is it working? Thank you so much, sir. Uh, first of all, uh, I have a personal tribute to make, and uh, thank you, because I stand here as an alumni, essentially because of your benevolence, you know. I, I, I remember uh, sitting down before you in desperation once, and you gave me an option of, you know, staying off campus with my young new wife, uh, and uh, giving me that opportunity to complete the schools. So thank you so much for that. My question is this. Um, you've been talking about the, the transformative requirements in the rural areas. You also talked about Irma and being the pioneer. My, you know, I also, I represent the, actually the alum, the would-be alum community as the president of the IAA. And today I stand before you in desperation. The desperation comes because 44 years, I sat before you 43 years back, 44 years hence, somehow the alum and the alma mater has not made a connect. And I think from what you spoke today, I think there is an enormous animal spirit to be released if all the alums of this great institution come together with the alma mater and work towards the transformation. And I, my, my request to you is, my question is this, what would you advise us how can we make this kind of a synergy work? Thank you.
Thank you, Mohan. You asked me one question that I have no easy answers for. You know, the, the concept of the alumni owning the, their alma mater is alien to India. In the US, the alumni literally own the, their alma mater through their generous support. Over generations, over centuries, the Harvard corpus has grown because the alumni have funded it in no small measure. And the same truth is true of almost all major un universities. Our educational bodies, unfortunately, have been tied to the purse strings mostly of the government and sometimes of the private enterprise. And private enterprise had seen, unfortunately, this as another money-making activity. So just as there are uh, sugar barons in Maharashtra, many of them have turned into education barons. That has not happened here, thank God for that. Similarly, Irma has retained a degree of autonomy, again, thank God for that. Now you want it to go the next step. So it is not despair, actually. It is really, you have crossed the survival stage, and you want to get into optimism. And that, I think, the need is, in this case, depends on the last P, people. That, I am sorry to say, the, the responsibility is mostly on the alumni. The alumni have to take the lead. They have to take a stand as a unified group. As I understand from some of you, that the alumni themselves are not a house united. First of all, get your own house in order, and then make a proposition to the institute that it cannot refuse. Not necessarily in terms of money, that is not an option that we have very easy to ex exercise. But in terms of what you can do, present an action plan, and then see if the institute does not react. I am positive that given any kind of uh, forward-looking thinking on the institute's part, any initiative that you take will be matched, more than matched, by the institute management. So I would say at this stage, don't despair. Don't use the word despair. I don't like the word despair, actually. Think in optimism and think of what you can do instead of what cannot be done. As I said, think outside the box and think of what you can do. You can, for example, make suggestions since you are all out in the world doing various things and you know the practicing world better than the faculty or the institute management. You can make positive contributions by suggesting how the institute could change to keep up with the world. Now, a young man accompanied me from uh, Baroda to here this morning, and he made an observation which I was not happy to hear. He said, in your time, Irma enjoyed a much better reputation than it does now. That is, that is not what I would like to hear at all, in any sense. I would want to hear that Irma is 100 times better today than what you had thought of. So that is something that the alumni can take the lead in helping Irma achieve. I don't think I have answered you in a concrete plan, but that is not my purpose. My purpose was to say that give up your despair. Thank you, sir, for the insightful session. So you mentioned how uh, Manrega as a policy had numerous failures, as well as you mentioned the success story of Operation Flood and uh, numerous other initiatives. But these initiatives were led by people's movement. So I wanted to ask if government were to lead an intervention, how can it, in, uh, it uh, encourage similar kind of uh, movement which is successful? I didn't get your question. 
Sir, you mentioned that the uh, uh, you should mention that the Manrega policy had number of failures because of the design in design flaws and how uh, it was not creating that self sufficiency. So, when government is designing some intervention, what can government do to okay. improve that? All right. Now, the first thing is to think beyond immediate relief. That you have this fund, you want to provide employment. Why not create permanent assets, which are badly required? Instead of talking about just some uh, relief roads and so on and so forth, why not use that money to create local uh, water harvesting projects? Why not talk about farm level ponds and so on? Why not create assets that will not get washed away with the next monsoon, but will help add to the productive resources of the area. The, the thing is, as long as we say that this is a relief, and the government's thinking, despite all the legislation and all the safeguards that was built, it, is, it has always been thought of as a relief measure. And that we have to shed that image of relief measure. Today, for example, today, with all this talk about India being a developed nation, in the next 25 years. We still have nearly 60% of the population dependent on free distribution of grain. So the government always thinks in terms of relief. It does not think in terms of creative assets, asset making. Now that is what something that I think we have to stress. Not all of us are part of the government, but we are not without our persuasive powers either. We need to emphasize this at our level. Instead of saying the government does that only, no. The government can be made to change if we talk sufficiently loud and with supportive evidence, strong, incontrovertible, supportive evidence. So this is what we need to do. Instead of saying leave it to the government and let it do what it can. That, that will not do. That is not how participative decision-making should work. I don't know if I answered your question, but yes. If there are no questions, I have a couple of concluding words. They say a prophet is without honor in his own country. But the bond between Irma and I is an exception to this. I am aware that I sound grossly pompous elevating myself to this title. I have received nothing but unadulterated, unadulterated affection from Irma from the time I left till date. And now the honor of delivering this address caps it all. I am in eternal debt to Irma, to the Irma community. As a token of my gratitude, I have made this humble offering of all that I have done through my long professional life as a mere foot soldier in the development army, armed with nothing more than my limited abilities. It is like that hero, valiant hero of the other 2611, Constable Tukaram Omble, who fended off dreaded terrorists with his nothing but his own official issue, Kane Star. So, thank you for listening to this monkey bath of mine. Today happens to be monkey bath. Thank you, sir, for delivering an enriching and insightful lecture. 
that I'm sure will inspire not only those who listen to your words today, both in person as well as virtually, but hundreds and thousands who will do so for years to come. I thank the audience for their questions and our honorable chief guest for his responses. I now request Dr. Manish Shah to present the honorable chief guest with a token of our gratitude. I now invite Professor Sham Singh, Dean Academic, to offer the vote of thanks. Respected Chief Guest, uh, Respected Chairman, Members of the IRMA Board, the Director, Invited Guest, Ladies and Gentlemen. It's my privilege to propose a vote of thanks on this occasion. On behalf of IRMA, I extend sincere thanks to our distinguished speaker, Dr. Srikant Samrani, for delivering an extremely relevant and insightful lecture on various facets of rural development, rural India, and rural management, uh, not only as an academic discipline, but also a field of practice. The issues that he covered ranging from agriculture, income, poverty, supply chain, procurement, MSP, form a very core of, very core mandate of this very great institutions. So thank you very much, sir, for your time in putting this lecture together for all of us. Our deep sense of gratitude to the Chairman Irma, NNDDV, Dr. Minesh Shahji, esteemed members of the Board of Governors Irma, Irma Society, alumni fraternity, dignitaries, guests from the media for taking out time for attending this event. I thank the director Irma for all the efforts made towards organizing this successful lecture. I extend a special thank to my faculty colleagues, the participants from fellow program, executive program, and PRM for their enthusiastic involvement in this event. I thank all my colleagues in the IRMA administration, including Chairman's Office, Director Office, State, Communications, Accounts, and other departments for the arrangements made towards making this event a great success. I thank all of you for participating in this event. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I request all of you to join us for the national anthem. Thank you.